Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hi, this is Alan Cross. Welcome to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast, our weekly exploration of the stories and characters that made modern music what it is today. We want to make this podcast one of your favorites. So if you love the show, do me a favor, tell a friend about it, or rate it on iTunes if that's your thing. We'd really love it if you do that. Or you can just drop me an email with your thoughts to alan at alancross.ca. Maybe you want more information on something you hear, or maybe you have an idea for a topic for a future episode, whatever. I guarantee your response, alan at alancross.ca. Whether you're listening one at a time or binging on a bunch of podcasts all at once, we're glad to have you here. All right, let's talk music, shall we? I don't know if you realize this, but the music festival is far from a modern creation. People have been gathering in fields to hear music for centuries, and in some cases, those original festivals are still happening. Ever hear of something called Fiera della Fricanola? It started in the village of Canalonga, up in the mountains in the south of Italy, and as far as we've been able to tell, the first gig for this festival was in 1450, and it's still happening today. There were other long-timey festivals in Germany and England and India and Latvia, so, like I said, the music festival is not a new thing. Now, the first modern music festival, the thing that would be recognizable to us today, would probably be Monterey Pop, which was held in San Francisco in the summer of 1967. That led to Woodstock and Glastonbury and Roskilde and a ton of others. But the 1990s was the decade where the festival really came into its own with a series of regular events that appeared year after year in the same spot and ones that moved from place to place. Europeans were pretty used to standing in fields in the mud and the rain and the heat, but we North Americans were late to the party. There was no tradition of us doing anything like this. We'd go to the occasional outdoor gig, but it wasn't the lifestyle thing that it had become in other parts of the world. But by the time the decade was over, we had embraced the summer festival. And now we have our own events and traditions. And it couldn't have happened without the 90s alt-rock nation. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and welcome to the ninth and final chapter on our look back at the alt-rock 1990s. And this time, the focus is going to be on outdoor music festivals and festival culture. Now, don't get me wrong. It's it's not like we didn't have these things before the 1990s here in North America, because we did. What we didn't have was a cultural tradition of going to these things summer after summer after summer. That all began to change very early in the decade. And when it did change... It was the alt-nation that built these traditions and this industry to where it is today. First, though, we we need to fill in with some backstory. The festival culture of the alt-rock nation in North America wouldn't have taken root without the expertise and experience gleaned from the big European events. The English became especially good at this. The most famous of all the European festivals has got to be Glastonbury, which was first staged in the fall of 1970. It is known as the largest annual greenfield festival in the world. And this simply means that people come to a field, and in this case it's Worthy Farm, which is a working dairy farm, for five days just about every June. It's been held annually since 1981, except for what are declared follow years, which come around every half decade or so, the idea being to give the land and the people who live in the area a bit of a break from the hordes. Glastonbury's founder is Michael Evis, who decided to get into the festival business after seeing Led Zeppelin play outdoors. He drew on an older Glastonbury tradition, a classical music and arts event that was held between 1914 and 1926, and he originally called his thing the Piltdown Festival, but that lasted just one year. Glastonbury has become a rite of passage for generations of music fans. Each event attracts somewhere in the neighborhood of 175,000 people, regardless of the heat or the cold or the rain or the mud. Glastonbury is such a draw that all tickets now sell out in less than an hour, months before any of the acts are announced. Legends are born there, careers are made and occasionally sidelined there, 
based on a single performance. And the list of Glastonbury performers is staggering. U2, Radiohead, Foo Fighters, Bowie, The Cure, Coldplay, Paul McCartney, Rolling Stones, Neil Young, Springsteen, Muse. Let's sample some of this. This is from 1997, and it's from the Chemical Brothers' Glastonbury set. The Chemical Brothers, live at Glastonbury, June 28, 1997. By the 90s, that festival was the gold standard by which all others were judged. On the continent, that honor probably belonged to Roskilde, a festival held in that Danish town pretty much right after Glastonbury. It was started by two high school students in 1971 and has been going ever since. In modern times, it can host up to 130,000 people who come to experience 180 different acts. There's rock, there's folk, there's electronica and hip-hop. They're all represented in one way or the other. There's also something called the Naked Run, which is a race around the campsite where the participants don't wear any clothes. The top male and the top female runner each get free tickets to the following year's event. This is now so popular that organizers have to run qualifier events before they get to the final. The lineups for Roskilde rival Glastonbury. U2, Bob Marley, Nirvana, Bob Dylan, Sex Pistols, Radiohead, Chili Peppers, Black Sabbath, Prince, Rage Against the Machine. And here's a recording from 1995. This is Oasis at the peak of their powers, live at Roskilde. Oasis, live at the Roskilde Festival in Denmark, June 30th, 1995. Roskilde's worst year was 2000, when nine people died and 26 were injured during Pearl Jam set in front of about 60,000 people at an area called the Orange Stage. That accident set new safety protocols in motion at festivals all over the world. I want to go back to England now for the twin festivals of Reading and Leeds. What makes these events unique is that they're really two festivals, Leeds in the north, Reading in the south, west of London. The gigs are held on the same days every August and share the lineup with schedules juggled accordingly. Acts just have to make the 300-kilometer journey between the cities. Leeds was added to this whole thing in 1999. Now, Reading, of course, being the older of the two, grew out of a jazz festival established in the 1950s that ran until the 1970s. That's when it was transitioned into a rock event. It also became the first major festival to really embrace British punk and British new wave, as well as British metal. Over the years, Reading and Leeds have hosted Green Day, Oasis, Blur, Muse, The Cure, The Stones, Pink Floyd, The Who, Black Sabbath, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, and ACDC. Nirvana played twice. Their 1992 appearance was recorded and released as a live album. This was the gig where Kurt was rumored to be deathly ill, and he was wheeled on stage in a wheelchair in a hospital gown. He got up, very unsteady, made his way to the microphone, then the charade was over, and Nirvana busted into one of their most memorable performances. But I want to go back to 1990, and you'll see why in just a second. On Sunday, August the 26th, Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction watched as 30,000 people lost their minds to the Pixies, the day's headliners. Farrell and his manager could not believe the energy coming from the crowd, and the image that stuck with both of them was when the Pixies played this song. The Pixies and Debaser from their Doolittle album. When Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction saw the reaction they got at Reading on August 26th, 1990, he thought to himself, why can't we have this kind of thing in America? And this is when we finally get into how the alt-rock nation of the 90s got the North American festival scene kick-started. Here is where we need to talk about Lollapalooza. Now, remember how I said that Perry Farrell was inspired by the Pixie set at Reading in 1990? That's where the idea for Lollapalooza came from. Now, there had been other festivals in the U.S., of course. There was Monterey, there was Woodstock, 
There was Altamont's, the Us Festivals. There was something called the Gathering of the Tribes. But all of them were rooted in one place. Lollapalooza would be different. It would be a traveling festival, moving from city to city over the course of a couple of months, which is not exactly the whole story. Jane's addiction was winding down and preparing for a farewell tour, and Lollapalooza was conceived as a Jane's Addiction farewell tour that masqueraded as a music festival. Okay, I know, semantics. But it's important to know that because that's the only way this thing got off the ground in the first place. The name Lollapalooza was picked because it was a word that came up in old Three Stooges clips. They got it from a late 19th century slang word that meant an extraordinary or unusual thing or event, which sounded perfect. The idea had its critics, and there were a lot of them, and they would say things like, wait, you're going to take a bunch of no-name, so-called alternative bands that no one cares about on the road for two months and expect to make money? This is going to be a disaster. And for some stops on that first tour, it did look like the naysayers would be correct. I remember the promoter handing me stacks of tickets for the Toronto show. I literally could not give them away. Said, look at what this is, what's happening. Why are you come and see the show for free? Eh, I don't know. I don't think so. The very first Lollapalooza show began outside of Phoenix on July 18th, 1991. The lineup featured Jane's Addiction, Susie and the Banshees, Living Color, Nine Inch Nails, Butthole Surfers, Rollins Band, Ice Tea and Body Count, and Fishbone. And we can say that it did just okay at the box office. If it made money, it wasn't a lot. But this first incarnation of Lollapalooza was a few months too early. It wrapped up on August 28, 1991. That was the day before some band called Nirvana released a new single called Smells Like Teen Spirit. And it was also on that day that a new group called Pearl Jam put out their debut record. A year later, the landscape had changed entirely. When the second Lollapalooza tour began on July 18, 1992, You couldn't get near the place. Sellout after sellout. Huge excitement. And listen to this main stage lineup. This is from 1992. The first band was Lush, an up-and-coming shoegazy band from the UK. Then Pearl Jam. Then The Jesus and Mary Chain. Then Soundgarden. After that, it was Ice Cube, who was fresh from his days with NWA. He was followed by Ministry. And the night closed with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who were still riding very high from their Blood Sugar Sex Magic album. And they opened their set like this. Chili Peppers from the main stage at Lollapalooza in 1992. And that was also the first year of a second stage on the tour. Various stops in the tour featured these bands, Stone Temple Pilots, Cypress Hill, Rage Against the Machine, and some group called Tool. 1992 through 1995 were the glory years for Lollapalooza. Nothing, and I mean nothing, better represented the state of the alternative nation during that time. Smashing Pumpkins, Beastie Boys, Green Day, Sonic Youth, Beck, Tool, Nick Cave, The Verve, Patti Smith, Moby, they all took part. 1996 was okay too, but the headliner that year was Metallica, which somehow didn't feel right. They kind of hijacked the whole thing. Oh, sure, the lineup still featured Soundgarden and the Ramones and Rancid and Rage and a few others, but the vibe had changed. There was one more tour in 1997, but by that time, enthusiasm had waned. Another attempt was made in 2003, but nobody remembers that. It wasn't until Lollapalooza was given a permanent annual home in Chicago in 2005 that it re-established itself as a major music festival. The Warp Tour took the idea of Lollapalooza and ran with it. Starting in 1995, it crisscrossed North America, occasionally veering up into Canada, with a super-efficient, self-contained operation that offered maximum music for a low, low price. Festival-goers got dozens and dozens and dozens of bands on each stop. Its creator was Kevin Lyman, a California-based event producer. Warp was primarily about punk, but eventually it branched out into different genres like hip-hop. The names who participated in tours over the years is absolutely staggering. I swear, all of the following played on the Warp Tour. No Doubt, Katy Perry, 
Eminem, Rise Against, Sum 41, The Offspring, Rancid, Blink-182, Beck, Fall Out Boy, Green Day, Jimmy Eat World, Limp Bizkit, Linkin Park, Weezer. The lineup history is so extensive that even the Warp people don't have a clear idea of everyone who's played on the tour. Let's go back to 1998. These are the Money Money Boss Tones. <laughs> The Muddy Muddy Boss Tones, performing at a stop on the 1998 Vans Warp Tour. This eventually became the longest running of all the North American traveling rock shows. Another defining music festival of the alt-rock 90s was Woodstock. There were two of them. Neither in Woodstock, New York, by the way. Um, actually, none of the Woodstocks have ever been in Woodstock. The first of the 90s was 1994 in Saugerties, New York, held on the 25th anniversary of the event on Max Yasker's farm in 1969. I was there amongst the 550,000-ish people, and um, boy, it was awful. It was a terrible organization, overpriced food, rain, mud, thunderstorms. But it got a lot of coverage, and a lot of alternative acts got big career boosts from performing. That included Nine Inch Nails, who performed Covered in Mud, The Chili Peppers with new guitarist Dave Navarro, Violent Femmes, Collective Soul, James, Blind Melon, The Cranberries. And then there was Green Day. Their Dookie album had been out since that February and had turned into a huge hit. They played on the Sunday. And by that time, the fans had had enough of being abused and started tearing up the turf and throwing it everywhere. And at some point in the confusion, bass player Mike Dirt was tackled by a security guard, a guy who was supposed to protect him. His face was smashed into a stage monitor, he broke a bunch of teeth, and he needed emergency dental surgery. But before that happened, though, Green Day turned in a pretty solid set. So upside, you've been thinking about the chin. Green Day, live at Woodstock 94, not too long before Mike Dirt was assaulted by his security guard and had his face and teeth broken. There was another Woodstock event five years later at an Air Force base in Rome, New York, and uh, really the less said about that one, the better. Vandalism, sexual assault, fires, property damage. Woodstock 99 was to the 90s what Altamont was to the 1960s, and that is not a good comparison. I want to touch on several more festivals before we're done. Three of them no longer exist, but the last one is now the biggest and most profitable descendant of Lollapalooza. As we've heard in several previous chapters on our series on the alt-rock 1990s, there was a lot of money to go around in the music industry back then. Music sales were going up and up and up and up and up every year, thanks to the golden age of compact discs. Gen X was buying a lot of music and going to a lot of shows. Lollapalooza showed that the idea of a traveling caravan of weirdo alt-rock bands could work, so other people thought they'd give the concept a whirl. There was Edgefest, which moved from being a Toronto-only thing to a national tour in 1997, 1998, and 1999. Our Lady Peace started Somersault in 1998. Sarah McLaughlin founded Lilith Fair, the female-centric festival that spun through North America for three consecutive summers starting in 1997. Then there was the Tragically Hip. They were at the peak of their powers, so when they decided to take a bunch of friends on the road with them for a chunk of the summer, everybody was all for it. Their traveling caravan was called Another Roadside Attraction. It was staged three times, 1993, 1995, and 1997. This is from the original road trip. The Tragical Hip, from their first Another Roadside Attraction Tour in 1993. There's one more festival from the 90s worth mentioning, because, well, it wouldn't exist had it not been for the atmosphere of the alt-rock 90s, and because it still exists, and that's Coachella. 
Coachella is a monster. It's spread over two weekends. People descend on the Empire Polo Grounds in Indio, California from all over the world every April. If there is a North American equivalent to Glastonbury, this is certainly it. But while most people consider Coachella to be a 21st century thing, it actually started in the 90s, October 9th and 10th, 1999. The lineup was fitting as we moved into the last 100 days of the decade. There was Beck and Morrissey, Underworld, Rage Against the Machine, Pavement, Modest Mouse. Sounded great, right? But only 10,000 people showed up. Making the drive out into the desert from L.A. didn't seem like much fun. It was also just a few months after the disaster that was Woodstock 99. There was no camping permitted on site, and the weekend was insanely hot. So no wonder attendance was bad. The promoter lost close to a million dollars, and they actually had to go back to several of the bands like Tool and Rage and said, could you wait a little while before we pay you out? That first Coachella was so rough, it almost killed the entire concept. There was no event in 2000, but it reappeared in 2001 and has been a going and growing concern ever since. I found a recording from that weekend in 1999. This is Morrissey doing his 1988 song, November Spawned a Monster. Morrissey, the very first Coachella Festival in October 1999. By the time the 90s drew to a close, the idea of a traveling alternative music festival was burning out. After 10 years of being the dominant sort of music and culture, alt-rock itself was on the wane. The artists who made it possible had grown up, moved on, or broken up. For example, groups like Pearl Jam were disavowing the G word, the grunge word, and making music that was less and less grunge sounding. Green Day hit a rough patch where nothing seemed to work for a while. The Smashing Pumpkins lost their way. U2 also lost their way. If the Britpop kids weren't hung over from their party, they were messed up on drugs. Oasis had flatlined while Blur had turned their back on Britpop. And then after Princess Diana died on August 31st, 1997, that really took the wind out of everybody's sails. The music had fragmented. Too many one-hit wonders. Genres like new metal polarized people. We'd also entered the phase of any rock cycle where the new artist coming out seemed like a copy of a copy of a copy of the original. Too derivative, too safe, too watered down. We can call this the Creed Syndrome. The Gen Xers who helped bring this music alive had also grown up and moved on. A new generation was entering the years of musical awareness, and they wanted their own tunes. Generation Y just wasn't into brooding grunge or any of the kind of intense post-punk alt-rock that their forebearers were. Their tastes leaned much more to the pop side. This cheerful generation led us to an era of Spice Girls and Backstreet Boys, in sync Britney Spears. The cycle of rock and pop had once again swung to where it was in the middle to late 1980s. That is to say, pop was in the ascendant. The economy had improved. In fact, America was enjoying a major bull market under Democrat Bill Clinton. The Cold War was over. The first Gulf War was a memory. The grimness of the early 1990s was all gone. Meanwhile, hip-hop and electronica continued to explode in popularity. That took some of the interest away from rock of all stripes. Sales of guitars fell. Sales of keyboards and samplers increased. So did turntables and mixers, as this new generation became besotted with DJ culture. And the money started to dry up. CD sales would continue to increase for a couple of years yet, but there was this thing, this this internet thing, that was starting to worry the industry, especially after June 1999, when people started using a new program called Napster to trade music in a new format called the MP3. What, you mean I can just go online and download whatever song I want from someone I don't know, and it's free? So that means I don't have to pay $20 for a CD which has just one good song. This is true? (laughs) Count me in. By the end of 1999, the number of people using peer-to-peer file sharing software had spiked up and it would continue that way for years. The record industry hasn't been the same since. In a few years, something called YouTube would come along and kill off the traditional music video channel. Then we had iTunes and iPods. But even as the 90s died out and alt-rock bottomed out, the seeds for the next cycle were already being planted. 
The pop kids would have their way for a while, but alt-rock would soon be back, thanks to a new crop of bands, indie artists, many of whom with no use for the standard music industry model. They had names like The Arctic Monkeys, Arcade Fire, The White Stripes, The Killers, and The Strokes. And within a few years, alt-rock would be back for another stretch in the sun. I really hope you enjoyed this nine-chapter series on 90s alt-rock. If you missed any of the installments, the whole series is available as podcasts. You can find everything for free at iTunes or wherever you get your on-demand audio. If there's anything you'd like to talk about, maybe about this series or anything else, I'm available through alan at alancross.ca. And I hope you can check me out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. I also have a website called thejournalofmusicalthings.com, which I update every single day. And to make it easier to keep track of what's going on, you can sign up for the free newsletter. That means music news and information in your inbox by 10 a.m. Eastern every day. Thanks for listening. Hope you got something out of this series. We'll do something like this again sometime soon. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.